Hi, this is Steve Pearson and uh, welcome to the ICER meeting on treatments for anemia and chronic kidney, kidney disease. We'll be starting in approximately one minute. Okay, welcome everyone, good morning. Thank you for attending today's public meeting of the California Technology Assessment Forum, otherwise known as CTAF, a partner of ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. I am Rena Fox, uh, chair of CTAF and uh, of today's forum. Today we'll be, we will be discussing the hypoxia-inducible factor prol hydroxylase inhibitors a potential new treatment for anemia in patients with chronic kidney disease, effectiveness and value. At the beginning of each meeting, we ask each of our CTAF panel members to introduce themselves and announce if they have any updates to their conflicts of interest to disclose. Every member of CTAF has met the conflict of interest policy of ICER, and today we ask if there are any updates to those disclosures. I will begin. I am Rena Fox, and I'm a professor of medicine at UCSF. I'm a general internist, a primary care physician, and a researcher in liver disease. I have no updates. Uh, we will go in order, and I will call on each CTAF member. Let's start with uh, Alex Smith. Hi, Alex Smith, professor of medicine at UCSF in the Division of Geriatrics, where I'm a clinician researcher, and I have no updates to my conflicts of interest. Thank you, Alex. Okay, uh, Anthony Sowery. Uh, yes, hi, um, I'm a volunteer in California for the National Patients Advocacy Foundation. Um, and I have no updates on the conflict of interest. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, Joy Melnikov. I am uh, Joy Melnico. I'm a family physician, professor of family medicine at the University of California, Davis, and direct the Center for Healthcare Policy and Research there. And I have no changes to my lack of conflicts of interest. Thank you, Joy. Paul Heinrich. Hello, I'm Paul Heinrich. I'm a cardiologist and a professor and vice chair of quality in the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. Thank you, Paul. Okay, Sai Lee. Uh, hi, my name is Sai Lee. I am a professor of medicine at UCSF Division of Geriatrics, a clinician and researcher, and no uh, updates to conflicts of interest. Thank you, Sai. Um, Ann Raldo. Hi, my name is Ann Raldo. I am an assistant professor of radiation oncology at UCLA, also a health services researcher with a special interest uh, in cost effectiveness, and I have no updates. Thank you. Okay, Catherine Phillips. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm a professor of health economics, UCSF. Thank you. Uh, Joanna Smith. Um, Joanna Smith, healthcare liaison, Berkeley, California. I do healthcare advocacy, no updates. Thank you, Joanna. Bob Collier. Hi, I'm Bob Collier. Uh, 
with patient advocates and research. I'm a 30 year patient advocate working with researchers. I have no updates. Thank you, Bob. Elizabeth Murphy. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Murphy. I'm a professor of endocrine, uh, medicine and endocrinology at UCSF and chief of the endocrine division at San Francisco General Hospital. And I continue to have no conflicts. Thank you. Kimberly Gregory. Kimberly Gregory, are you on? Okay, we can come back to Kim. Um, let me make sure. Uh, Ralph Brindis. Hi, Ralph Brindis, clinical professor of medicine, trained in cardiology with an interest in uh, cardiovascular uh, outcomes research at uh, UCSF. I have no additional conflicts or none to disclose. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Jeffrey Hotch. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hotch. I'm a professor of health economics in the Department of Public Health Sciences at UC Davis. I'm also the associate director for the Center for Healthcare Policy and Research. I have no updates on my lack of conflict of interest. I am not sure if I have forgotten anyone. Um, hard to scroll through my participant list, but if there's any CTAF member that I have not called on. Oh, I'm so sorry, Richard, Richard Seidner, my apologies. It's not, I, I just can't see everyone at once. No, no problem. I'm Richard Seiden, patient advocate, uh, no conflicts. And let me try again for Kimberly Gregory. Okay, any other CTAF member that I, we have not introduced? Okay, uh, thank you everyone. At this point, we will also ask our individual patient advocates and clinical experts to introduce themselves and announce any conflicts of interest if they have any to disclose. Uh, let's start with Troy Zimmerman. Hello, I am Troy Zimmerman. I'm the Special Projects Director for the National Kidney Foundation and there are no changes to my previously uh, disclosed conflicts. Thank you, Troy. Uh, Patrick G. Hello, my name is Patrick G. I'm the founder of Our Advocate, a health and wellness organization, and I'm also a healthcare consultant and patient advocate. I have no updates. Thank you, Patrick. Penelope Capitzanu. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Penelope Capitzinu. Um, I am an associate professor at Northwestern University. I practice nephrology and I run a lab uh, focused on um, exploring um, molecular responses to hypoxia and hypoxia inducible factors. I have no updates on my conflicts of interest. Thank you so much. And finally, Jeffrey Burns. Uh, hello, uh, I'm, I'm Jeff Burns. I'm a professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a practicing nephrologist. I have no changes to my lack of conflicts. Thank you. I will also add a reminder to everyone, whether it is later at the round table or during public comment, to please introduce yourself and announce any conflicts of interest financial relationships with industry or any potential influences on your judgment before you speak. And at this point, I would like to introduce Dr. Steve Pearson, founder and president of ICER. Steve. Thanks, Rena. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to those of you who are watching this um, via the webcast. Um, so let me dive right in. Why are we here today? Let me um, quote a patient who has chronic kidney disease, and you will find us slipping into the um, frequent use of acronyms. I, no offense meant, certainly. I think it may help us uh, get through the day a little bit quicker. Here's the quote. Managing my anemia has probably been the biggest challenge for me. It impacted my energy levels to an unbelievable degree. And as a naturally social and busy person, that was very hard for me mentally and emotionally. Finding a treatment that worked was quite a journey. It required constant adjustments and medications until I found a balance that made me feel good day to day. I'm lucky to have found something that worked. I know many other people with CKD are still trying to find that balance. 
So what this reflects um, is that part of the reason we're here today is because there's uh, an important need uh, that this condition can have an important impact on people's lives and that um, finding new treatments and new ways to care for patients with um, anemia due to chronic kidney disease um, is an important goal for us all. So what happens the day that new treatments, and I know we're here to talk primarily about uh, Roxadustat, um, and it has yet to be approved by the FDA, but let's imagine in general, what happens the day that these kinds of treatments are approved by the FDA? Well, the first thing that happens is, is a real sense of celebration because that unmet need has another, there's another option, another tool in the toolbox. Um, and it also represents often the culmination of years of research, years of investment, risk-taking by both the companies involved, by clinical researchers, certainly by the patient community that participates in the clinical trials. And so there is this sense of success and of welcomed celebration. The other thing that happens is that from day one, people start to say, how much will this cost? Will my insurer cover it? And all of the different kinds of issues that come into how a new treatment gets brought into clinical practice. So as a, as a result of that, it's often the case that patients can have difficulty accessing new drugs. Um, not always, but it's a, it's a factor of the way that our system works that there, there can be challenges there and it can be because of coverage, it can be because of cost. And so we really face an interesting point when drugs are nearing the time of FDA approval because a lot of the parameters around coverage, pricing, and costs are going to be determined in the near future. So it's helpful, I think, to, uh, to meet, to talk about the evidence and to talk about how we try to sort through some of these aspects to make sure that that sense of celebration um, around any new treatment um, is done in a way that um, benefits everybody. And that last part about benefiting everybody is important to keep in mind because we're not here today just to think about the patients who have chronic kidney disease and anemia and the treatments available for them, I think it's important that we remember that um, we are all in one way or another part of a um, healthcare system. And what happens to patients and others in the healthcare system when new treatments are approved? Um, just to give you some context for this, this is a picture of a man named Leonard Edlow, who was in a newspaper article recently. He's a pharmacist um, and a pastor in, in Virginia. And his father was a pharmacist and opened up a family-owned pharmacy back in the 1940s. And uh, Mr. Edlow talks a lot about the effects that he sees on people that he serves as a pharmacist and in his community, the effects of what happens when there's not enough money to pay for health insurance, because that's part of the tension that we face and why we're here today. I mean, and every time we get a new drug, it may or may not add new costs to the healthcare system. And those costs are part of what we all face as a challenge to be able to afford and use um, the healthcare system. And Mr. Edlow points out, as, as is I think well known, um, but deserves further attention, the fact that um, uh, you know, in many communities that we often don't see, the effects of higher costs on the health insurance system are not just um, blown off, they are something that really create day-to-day -day struggles. And among black Americans, they are half as likely, in, for instance, in Medicare, to have a supplementary kind of prescription coverage. And so they're much more likely to have to go without um, coverage um, for drugs and to have to pay for it somehow out of pocket. Um, among the uninsured in this country, 55% of them are African-Americans there is a very large impact on their ability to try to uh, obtain healthcare that needs to be part of the balance that we're seeking. And so part of the reason we're here today is that we are going to talk about patients and families grappling with chronic kidney disease. And forgive the icons that suggest that there's just one kind of family, but perhaps you'll allow me that with the colors I can suggest that there are many different kinds of individuals and families in our communities and as we focus today deeply into this discussion around the evidence on treatments and the value that, that can be brought to patients with chronic kidney disease, we have to remember that we need to seek a balance between access and affordability so that everyone can benefit.
And so it's partly that balance that we seek that brings us here today to have hopefully a, a, you know, a kind of conversation that our country needs to have more often, um, more transparently, that can help us understand the evidence and the trade-offs involved. So you've already met the distinguished members of the California Technology Assessment Forum. As ICER is the, the convening host of these meetings, let me tell you just a brief word about us and the process that we take for these reports. So first, our um, funding, and if you will, our potential conflicts of interest, this shows that for our overall revenue, approximately 68% this year will come from nonprofit foundations, the chief amongst which is the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. We also get funding from the California Healthcare Foundation and recently from other nonprofit foundations, including the Commonwealth Foundation and the National Institute for Healthcare Management. Um, for a separate policy summit program we run to try to bring leaders together uh, to work out coverage and pricing issues, we take direct contributions from health plans and provider groups, as you can see, and manufacturers, um, but that goes solely to those programs and does not support the research or the meetings that we hold on these kinds of topics. We do have approximately 10% of our revenue from government contracts and a very small percent from individual matching contributions. So the report today that serves as the, the backdrop, if you will, for the discussion begins almost eight months ago with a phase of what we call scoping, where we turn to the patient groups, clinical experts, the manufacturers and other stakeholders and, and really ask to be oriented, ask to be guided to what are the important questions? What are the issues? What you know, can we learn from the diversity of the patients who are experiencing this condition? And where can we find evidence? Can we generate new evidence? Where can we find evidence even if it's not been published? So we go off our staff to do a deep dive into that evidence and to bring it uh, forward with an objective um, and independent look. We also um, work with outside academics frequently to uh, create a cost effectiveness model. I'll talk about cost effectiveness more in a second, but it's to look at the long-term value of treatments. These efforts, turn into a report that goes through several cycles of public comment and revision, including um, in this case, um, two expert reviewers who are with us for the meeting, Dr. Burns and Dr. Kapitsinu, pardon me, and thank you again for your efforts there. So what does this report look like? Um, for those of you who haven't read it, um, it's structured in a way that is meant to um, reflect a, a view of value, if you will, the information that we feel um, that we want to bring forward in public discussion. So let's talk about the key feature there, which is long-term value for money. We also talk about budget impact, but we spend the vast majority of these meetings talking about long-term value for money. And in our reports, that's really kind of reflected by sections that cover the following major components. Um, the first is we wanna ask whether treatments could potentially help us live a longer life. Another important health benefit for some drugs, many drugs actually, that don't extend life. They may, however, help improve our health by helping return function um, or to keep us from losing function. They may have fewer side effects and other treatment options. So that's another way that we want to look at the health benefits of, of new treatments. We want to make sure that if we're looking at costs, and that's the value for money part, that we're thinking not just about what the new treatment might cost itself, but whether it might help uh, reduce costs by fewer hospital visits or fewer doctor visits or less need for other medications, that kind of thing. Now, beyond those, we want to make sure that we're also talking and thinking as concretely as possible about potential benefits beyond health, if you will. And we'll talk about potential effects on the family, on patients' ability to work, um, and other benefits of a treatment that might extend beyond um, a, a more narrow conception of health. And then also kind of at the top, or even in some sense, wrapping around all of these can be certain social or ethical priorities that we want to think about. And this will come up when we talk about things such as um, the potential for this to help disadvantaged patients, patients with um, very severe or long-term conditions. So we'll talk about all these today, and they're all in the report itself. Um, and just to, to kind of nail the issue around the pricing aspects of this as a component of value and how cost effectiveness works there. I wanted to share briefly this, this graph and it looks like math and it's gonna just, just bear with me. But the way that cost effectiveness kind of works in our context to think about 
um, a price that would align with the benefit to patients is that we start where that blue dot is with the best that we can do for patients today. And it has a certain cost and a certain effectiveness, a certain amount of better health that it can provide. And then we're gonna be talking about new treatments. Today, it's just gonna be one, but sometimes it could be more than one. And we'll say, for instance, just as an example, the treatment might be more effective and be more expensive overall. And then we might have another treatment, let's say, that's even more effective than the first one in yellow, but it is a, as you can see, a much higher cost. Cost effectiveness basically tries to capture all of those effects on effectiveness and cost. And then it asks the question of us about whether there's a threshold or a range at which we think the price matches up fairly with the added benefits. Because if the price is too high for the relative added benefits, we would say that in a sense, it's not a good value. We're spending too much for that health. And remember, if we spend too much for the health we get, we're gonna affect the other folks in the health system that we can't see as easily who are trying to afford ever higher healthcare costs for insurance. So the way this works with a drug's price is to say, if we think the price here for this second treatment is too high to be in our health maximization threshold range, a terrible term, but one that means that we're trying to make sure that we do get the most health out of a new treatment, we would say that the cost effective price, if you will, would be one that drops it into that range, at least to the top end of that range. And then within that range, maybe we'll think about, you know, those other effects that I mentioned, the benefits beyond health and um, the special priorities. So again, to put this in one more graph, if we start with that threshold range where we can maximize health, recent evidence in the United States continues to show that that threshold range is right around 100,000 for additional added quality adjusted life year or equal value of a life year gained as we do it. And that therefore you could say that that's the maximum price we would wanna pay for any new treatment. But what about those other factors? Well, you could say we're gonna consider them within a range that stretches from below that pricing threshold at the top from maybe 50,000 to 100,000. And that's where we're gonna consider those benefits beyond health and special priorities. For historical reasons, um, ICER has shifted to do our pricing higher than that. So it means we're already starting, if you will, at a fairly high cost effectiveness range and thinking about these other factors, the benefits beyond health. So this is just to give um, those, especially those who are not familiar with ICER reports or the approach that we take to thinking about incremental cost effectiveness and value, I wanted to give you some conceptual, at least picture of how we do that. So the agenda for today, we'll start with a presentation of the evidence, um, um, both on the clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. We'll have a short break, followed by the chance for manufacturers and members of the public to make comments and to have discussion. Then we will have lunch, um, followed by a return for the CTAF to further deliberate on the evidence and to take specific votes on clinical effectiveness, other benefits and contextual issues and value. This uh, meeting will culminate with a policy roundtable, including the patient representatives, uh, the clinical experts that you've already been introduced to, along with um, representatives from payer organizations and from the manufacturers in this area, so that we can talk more about how to translate the evidence into coverage, into pricing, and into a way that these treatments can be introduced that we think can, again, maximize the benefits for patients, keeping in mind the broader healthcare context in which we all work and live. With that, we will be done by 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific, and I'm gonna kick it off then by handing it over to um, our evidence author, um, uh, Professor Mustafa, who will take us through the information on clinical effectiveness. Dr. Mustafa. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Reem Mustafa. I'm an associate professor of medicine, and I'm the director of outcomes and implementation research at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And I have been contracted to be the lead author on this review. Next, please. I, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with uh, some of the ICER members, um, specifically uh, Grace Fox, uh, Felucio Agbula, Noemi Fluic, and I do not have a conflict of interest to report. 
Next. And as uh, some background, um, anemia is a very common in patients with chronic kidney disease, and it becomes more prevalent as chronic kidney disease progresses from what we call dialysis independent. So that is when patients do not yet require dialysis to dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease. Uh, fatigue, as already Steve pointed out in one of the patient's quotes, affects the living experience and the quality of life of patients with chronic kidney disease. And it's a very common theme that is always mentioned when we're talking about anemia and chronic kidney disease. There's a group of medications um, called ESAs or erythropoietin stimulating agents. And before this group of medication became available, really the main treatment that we were able to offer to uh, patients with anemia and chronic kidney disease was blood transfusion. And with blood transfusion, there are lots of concerns about developing some antibodies that will sensitize patients and really decrease their chance of receiving transplant, which is an important option as far as a better management uh, if they require um, after they need dialysis. ESAs were approved um, in the late 1980s, 1990, and there has been a rapid and widespread uptake of these medications in patients with chronic kidney disease because of some literature showing association between anemia and high mortality in uncontrolled studies. However, Subsequent randomized trials showed that correction of anemia and maintenance of hemoglobin to near normal levels with ESAs does increase mortality and cardiovascular events without consistently improving quality of life. And that led to a lot of changes in uh, guidelines and what is recommended and really a shift in practice uh, because of this, uh, these findings. Next, please. Now we have um, this new um, group of medications, uh, which are the hypoxia inducible factor propyl hydroxylate. We're gonna call them HIF inhibitors. And they've emerged as an option and they're an oral option. As you see on the left side, these molecules, the green um, HIF molecules, under normal oxygen circumstances, normoxia, we actually, um, they get hydroxylated and eventually degraded. However, in settings where there is hypoxia, low oxygen level, um, these HEF molecules join other um, HEF molecules and really initiate um, activation of some of the important genes that do help in this whole process we call the erythropoiesis, which is producing blood and essentially making sure that this is the like the whole pathway to manage anemia. And as you see in here, it's not just one factor. So they affect the production of erythropoietin, for example, uh, the epigen receptors, decrease hepcidin and so on. So they initiate this whole cascade. Important things to keep in mind that these HIF inhibitors induce lower but more consistent erythropoietin level uh, compared to ESAs. And they were hypothesized that they could cause fewer um, adverse cardiovascular events than ESAs. And that's why there's a lot of excitement about them as an option. Next, please. Um, we've had a lot of discussion with um, patients and um, advocacy groups. Um, it became clear that patients place high value on autonomy and ability to maintain activity of daily living. Again, fatigue is a common theme. And, and this is another quote from another patient. It was something that I really had to manage because it really affected my energy level. It also became um, very clear that some patients feel better after anemia treatment and some do not. And um, it, it, there was a clear desire for more choices related to anemia management, especially for those who experience side effect with ESAs, those who do not tolerate ESAs, 
um, patients who are not responsive or unable to achieve the target hemoglobin level with ESAs, and also for those patients who have some contraindication to receiving ESAs. Next, please. Um, we also, uh, you know, noted that ESA choice is dependent on factors that are typically not patient related. So for example, patients do prefer to receive longer acting ESAs, usually ESAs are injections, so that leads to less frequent injections. Um, there are specific ESAs products that are used by different dialysis providers. Not really for any reason, just that's what they use. ESA's availability varies for inpatient and outpatient and really depends on formulary. And there are different ESAs that are used differentially in the dialysis independent group and the dialysis dependent group. And that is really based on market agreements. Um, supporting innovation and new treatment option was also very important to patients and advocacy group. And um, there were multiple discussions around concerns for a specific payment structure, which is the Medicare bundle payment, um, that the patients and advocacy group were concerned that this could stifle innovation. Next, please. So now just to talk about the scope of our review, uh, we focused on population who are adults with anemia and chronic kidney disease. And in that, We've already mentioned we have the group with dialysis independent before they need dialysis. And within there, there are multiple stages. So more advanced stages three, four, and five. And as I mentioned, as we mentioned, the more the advanced um, the, the stage of the kidney disease, the more likely patients will have anemia and require treatment. And then from there, patients progress to become dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease patients. And in there, there was this group that has been reported on in the literature, which is what we call the incident dialysis. So after they start dialysis the first few weeks to few months early on, um, in that group, we had questions if we should look into it, but because it was reported, we decided to um, include it as a subgroup. However, we also were very interested in specific subgroups, those patients who have ESA hyporesponsiveness, and I'll come back to that group, those with cardiovascular disease, patients with cancer. And we performed a meta-analysis of uh, Roxadustat. Um, we did not perform a network meta-analysis simply because of the cause, what I mentioned earlier, the practice pattern has changed over the years and we use much lower doses of ESA nowadays and lower targets for hemoglobin. We aim for lower targets. So we felt that would not be appropriate. Next, please. Now, um, and you can click a couple times. These outcomes are the outcomes we were interested in. Clearly, you will see that um, there are patient important outcomes, which are the outcomes our patients clearly prioritize when we talked with them. Unfortunately, a lot of what was in the literature was about anemia, hemoglobin level, without correlating that to the functional status or fatigue. So we were really mainly interested in mortality and MACE outcomes. We focused on blood transfusion. We wanted to see any of the outcomes that relate to quality of life or functional status, but we were limited with what we found. Next, please. Now to summarize the results of um, our review, everything I'm gonna present from here moving on is gonna be divided into these three categories. So we're gonna start with the dialysis independent chronic kidney disease. And within that group, the group that you have on the left side, we have two different comparisons. The first comparison in studies where they looked at Ruxatostat versus ESA, and then there is another group that looked at Ruxatostat versus placebo. I want to note that there was only one randomized trial that looked at Ruxatostat, sorry, Ruxatostat versus ESA and three trials that compared Ruxatostat versus placebo. However, we, the next, after we finish these, we will present data about dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease. And in that group, there is only one comparison. It's Ruxatostat versus ESA. However, 
Um, we have four trials. These trials reported the comparison of the ESA wasn't always the same. And three of them, it was one um, specific ESA called Ibotin Alpha. However, in another trial, they combined different ESAs. Because of all the reasons I mentioned to you earlier, we did not feel that we want to treat ESAs differently. So regardless of what, which specific ESA was the comparison, we wanted to look at all um, this together. So now let's start by talking about dialysis independent chronic kidney disease. First comparison, Ruxadostat versus ESA. I want to just note that you see there are four trials, three trials, one trial. Unfortunately, the, major, the vast majority of the data we were able to identify was from unpublished or non-peer-reviewed uh, sources. So uh, we used a lot of dossiers, a lot of abstracts, and, and that really limited our ability to look at some important stuff that we wanted to. Next, please. So in this first group, um, you will see that um, based on one trial, um, we did not identify or that trial did not show any statistically significant um, decrease in all-cause mortality, MACE or MACE plus. MACE plus was MACE plus hospitalization. And um, we also, we know that, that there was statistically significant difference for IV iron supplementation. You can click one more time. And um, however, again, there wasn't um, any statistically significant effect on quality of life. Next slide, please. So with that, we know that Ruxadostat does not significantly increase hemoglobin, does not reduce cardiovascular safety event or lead to clinically meaningful difference in health related quality of life compared to ESAs. Ruxadostat does reduce IV iron supplementation use. And when we specifically looked at all-cause mortality, where there was a hazard ratio of 0.83 with a confidence interval that crosses the line of no effect from 0.5 to 1.3a, we wanted to apply this relative effect to see what is the absolute effect on our population. So we used a baseline risk from the trial which was 11%. So 11% of people with chronic kidney disease will die from, um, will die in, if we're untreated. And when we applied our number, it looked like the absolute effect for using Ruxadostat versus ESA um, would range from five fewer to four additional deaths per 100 patients treated for up to two years. And with this, we felt this includes a potential large benefit to a large harm. And given this uncertainty, we rated the evidence comparing Ruxatostat to ESA in the dialysis independent group as insufficient. Next, please. Next, please. Now we're gonna look at this second group, which is the dialysis independent again, chronic kidney disease, but now we're comparing Ruxatostat to placebo where we have three trials. Next, please. And again, here we have this overall summary of the different effect estimates we identified. And again, I wanna point out that we did not identify statistically significant difference for all cause mortality or MACE. However, there was a statistically significant reduction in blood transfusion I want to bring your attention to the third row where it's all cause mortality. We report there two different numbers. We have a hazard ratio of 1.06, and we have a relative risk that was calculated by ICER with 1.15. We did receive a lot of comments and had a back and forth over the last uh, few weeks. And I want to hand it now to uh, David Rent from ICER, who will specifically discuss this issue further before we wrap up our assessment of the evidence for this group. David, to you. Thank you, Reem. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm David Rand, I'm ICER's Chief Medical Officer. And this is clearly an important issue, again, because it's looking at the safety of Roxadustat versus placebo or no treatment for 
anemia in these dialysis independent patients. And in our draft evidence report, this was a forest plot that appeared. And you can see that across the three trials, you have between a 14% and a 17% increase in all-cause mortality. And that when we meta-analyzed that, we ended up with a relative risk of a 15% increase of borderline statistical significance. And that was what was in our draft report. Let's move on to the next slide. So on that draft report, we got comments back, including from the manufacturer, stating that this wasn't counting all deaths the way the manufacturer had counted deaths. And was also, it was looking at events. Those were, that was a relative risk rather than time to events, a hazard. And so they were telling us that the correct number by their calculations was this pooled hazard ratio for mortality of 1.06, which wasn't statistically significant and was substantially lower than that 15% that we had calculated. And based on this, and because it was a hazard ratio, uh, that's the number we published in the evidence report. We then, after the evidence report, the report that the panel has, um, we received additional comment uh, that caused us to look further at these results. And so let's go to the next slide. Hazard ratio is the expected measure in a trial like this. It's the measure that we'd like to have, um, but it would be unusual for it to be very different from the relative risk. That difference between the 1.06 and the 1.15 is actually pretty surprising. Hazard ratio though is what comes out of a time to event analysis and that's what we would expect as the primary analysis out of these trials. It turned out after we looked into this further that the pooled hazard ratio of 1.06 is for all deaths during the study periods, including deaths in patients no longer on therapy. And that's actually a relatively large effect potentially because in at least some of these trials, maybe all of them, there were patients who had substantial periods of time by the design of the trial, not just because they stopped taking therapy, although that would be an effect too, but substantial periods of time under the design of the trial, a year or more, maybe two years, where they were not on therapy and being followed. And so we're looking at deaths of people no longer on therapy and trying to figure out whether the therapy is causing harm. And that's an okay safety endpoint, but if the therapy is only increasing mortality while you're on it, uh, potentially you're going to dilute out that effect in a big way. In the studies where we had pulled the deaths out for the event analysis of relative risk, we think that that were, uh, was events up to 28 days of stopping therapy. And that would better, from our sense, give us a feeling for whether the therapy itself was increasing mortality. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to pool hazard ratios for that outcome. And so we can't tell whether this on therapy plus 28 days after stopping therapy number that we're calculating of 1.15 would be the same if we had done a hazard ratio time to event analysis, whether the hazard ratio would have been 1.15 or something different. So we're left with substantial uncertainty about the best estimate of mortality with Roxidustat. Uh, we don't know whether we should be using the relative risk that we're calculating that is the type of mortality that we think is most important while you're on the drug and for a month after, or we should be using the hazard ratio because a hazard ratio is a time to event analysis that we prefer, but the one we have is for a much longer time period. And so this increases our uncertainty about the comparison of Roxidustat with placebo. And with that, I'll hand it back to Dr. Mustaf. Thank you, David. So um, next slide, please. So with that, to just put all of this together, when we look at the dialysis independent chronic kidney disease for Roxadostat versus placebo, uh, Roxadostat significantly increased hemoglobin compared to placebo without statistically significantly increasing the risk of cardiovascular safety event or generally leading to clinically meaningful difference in health-related quality of life. Rexadostat reduces the need for blood transfusion, rescue therapy with ESA, and the need for IV iron. But like um, Dr. Ren just 
you know, clearly outlined, we are left with substantial uncertainty about the best estimate of mortality with Roxadostat. This increases our uncertainty about comparison of Roxadostat with placebo. And given all this uncertainty, we did rate the evidence comparing Roxadostat to placebo as insufficient, which was at one point, um, uh, you know, potentially beneficial, but uh, uh, so it is insufficient now. Next, please. Now we've talked about the dialysis independent chronic kidney disease, and we're gonna switch gears and talk about dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease. Um, and in here, we have one comparison, Ruxatostat versus ESA. Next, please. As you see from this summary, um, that when we look at all cause mortality, again, whether it's the analysis uh, that was provided to us or our own analysis, there is no statistically significant um, uh, difference in all cause mortality. However, important to note that there was a reported statistically significant um, decrease in MACE plus, but I really wanna want all of you to note whenever there is an asterisk next to this effect estimate, it means that there was a really important trial that was not included in that analysis. And we all we have is this pooled analysis that is provided to us. With that, we do also note that there was a statistically significant decrease in risk of blood transfusion when using Ruxadostat versus ESA in this group. Next, please. I really want to, we feel this is important for you to look at this forest plot. Um, and the one trial that has not been included in these pooled analyses is that, that last trial called Pyrenees. And looking at this forest plot highlights that the relative risk of mortality in Pyrenees is higher than these other studies. And we're concerned that not including Pyrenees in these other analyses for the other outcomes that we are maybe not getting the full picture. The other thing I wanna highlight is Pyrenees was the only study that was done only in stable dialysis dependent patients. So those are patients that are not just started, they've been on dialysis for a long time. The first study on this first plot, Himalayas, is the study that was done only in these incident dialysis patients. So in the beginning, right after they started dialysis, the other two studies included both. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So data for most endpoints are only available in pooled analysis that exclude Pyrenees, and that concerns us. Roxadostat does not significantly increase hemoglobin, reduce the risk of MACE or all-cause mortality, or lead to clinically meaningful difference in health-related quality of life compared to ESAs. Roxadostat reduced risk of MACE plus in that pooled analysis that did not include Pyrenees, Roxadostat appeared to reduce use of blood transfusion and IV iron supplementation compared to ESA. When we look at all cause mortality specifically and we use our analysis, there is a relative risk of 1.05, so 5% increased risk of mortality. However, the confidence interval goes from 0.88 to 1.26. Again, using baseline risk from the trials included, the risk of mortality in this group is high, 15%. And when we translate that to absolute effect, it could range from two fewer to four additional deaths for patients who receive Ruxatostat compared to ESA per 100 patient treated. And the treatment period here, the time frame is between one to four years of treatment. Again, given all this uncertainty, we rate the evidence comparing Ruxadostat to ESA as insufficient. Next. We wanna highlight that there was this um, subgroup. I mentioned this um, you know, incident versus stable dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease subgroup. There were reported results of pooled analysis specifically for the incident dialysis dependent CKD, which is from one trial and a small proportion of patients from two other trials. 
That subgroup analysis showed a significant reduction in risk of MACE and MACE inhibitor in that specific subgroup who started just started on dialysis. However, the results were mainly driven by that one trial that only included this group of patients. So this is what we what we call, you know, um, between study um, comparison versus within study. And the lack of reported data about the stable dialysis dependent patient in these two trials prohibited us from actually pooling MACE and MACE inhibitor in the stable dialysis dependent patient, which theoretically could have had an increase in the risk of MACE and MACE inhibitor. So with that, we're quite uncertain that this is a true or a reliable subgroup effect. And for that reason, we did not really rely on it as, as we look through this um, evidence. Next, please. Now that we have talked about those, you know, dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease, whether it's roxadostat versus ESA or roxadostat versus placebo, we rated the evidence as insufficient. And same thing for the dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease for roxadostat versus ESA, we rated that as insufficient. Next, please. Just to talk about some controversies and uncertainties, patient with known heart failure, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, a stroke, seizure, or venous thromboembolism, and uncontrolled hypertension were all excluded from the trials. These are really important subgroups of particular interest, given that they have known harms from ESA and these would be in, in, of interest to clinicians and to patients to see if they should explore um, HIF inhibitors. It is also uncertain whether the increase in cardiovascular risk seen in older trial of ESAs were due to high hemoglobin levels versus high ESA doses. Um, so that's, that's important to keep in mind. And the lack of reported data on quality of life and functional status and fatigue further limited our ability to assess the impact of roxadostat on these outcomes, which were the most important to the patients. Next, please. And we wanna highlight some potential other benefits uh, that I think we should all uh, keep in mind. Uh, HIF inhibitors are a novel mechanism of action. Um, they are an oral option and this is likely important to keep in mind, especially for patients who are dialysis independent before they're on dialysis and for patients who receive dialysis at home because they don't need to take injections. For patients receiving dialysis in a center, people who go three times a week to a dialysis center, an infusion or infused option in dialysis is likely easier increase adherence, they don't have to worry about the new medications, just keep that in mind. We also have to know that there is a higher prevalence of chronic kidney disease in a different diverse groups and minority groups, African Americans, Latinx, and, and others. Next, please. We received different public comments. Um, I think we talked a lot about the mortality in the dialysis independent chronic kidney disease. Dr. Ren went over that and over all um, the back, lot of back and forth. I wanna go back to the idea we did receive comments that we should not be pooling Peronis results because they use two different um, ESAs. However, I hope I presented to you a lot of evidence to show that ESAs have been shown to have similar efficacy and safety profiles. They're used interchangeably. We didn't feel there is a need to separate Peronese. And there is this idea of ESA hyporesponsiveness and inflammation. And while inflammation contributes to hyporesponsiveness to ESA, evidence point to multiple factors that may influence hyporesponsiveness our evaluation is informed by the available evidence and we acknowledge the limitation of using inflammation status as a surrogate for hyporesponsiveness. And we hope that the manufacturers in the future would actually design trials and report results that better explore this issue. We also received um, and we acknowledge that there was a difference in the use of rescue therapy between the treatment arm in the trials in which ESAs 
were used as part of the rescue therapy for the roxatostat arm. Again, important thing to note, however, the limited available data hinder further exploration of the impact of these differences and the potential associated biases with them. Next. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. That was fantastic. Um, we uh, have some time for questions. For the uh, anyone who would like to ask a question from CTAF, please use the raised hand function and I will call on you. Okay, Elizabeth Murphy. Thanks for that great summary. That was very clear. And having said that, I apologize if this is something that you covered, but given we now understand the initial use of the ESAs led to um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes when trying to normalize the hemoglobin. Is there good data uh, available with goals at lower hemoglobins that that is better than placebo for those, for those drugs? Um, yeah, excellent question, um, Elizabeth. If, if you're asking better, um, using ESAs does help with anemia management. Um, but if you're specifically asking about um, cardiovascular events and mortality, we don't, we don't have that data. You know, when we started using ESAs, we started using the higher doses and we knew it's bad and then we kind of backed off. At this point, especially for the dialysis dependent uh, CKD, it's very hard to just not give them anything. It, it's almost impossible. You, you, you treat them because otherwise you end up with blood transfusion and all the problems with that. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the challenge that we're, we're having to deal with here. Thank you. And I assume no quality of life data is available in that lower hemoglobin target either. That's actually, it's unfortunate how, how sparse the data about quality of life in, in nephrology is. And if, if uh, anyone and our, if our clinical experts have anything else that they would like to add to that, please feel free. Um, I would just add uh, in terms of um, outcomes associated with um, ESA treatment, uh, probably the most recent information that we have is from the TREAT study. There was actually a, an interesting follow-up paper that looked at the ESA response, I believe at 30 days after starting darbapoetin therapy, and this was a placebo-controlled trial. And the very interesting observation, this was published uh, in the New England Journal in 2010, is that the cardiovascular composite endpoints, death from any cause, and so forth were higher among individuals who didn't uh, respond, which I think the, the definition of response was greater than one gram per deciliter of hemoglobin increase over 30 days, than either the placebo group or the group that met that response. But there was no difference in those outcomes between the placebo treated group and the patients who got darbapoetin with a, with a response. So it's almost as if failure to respond is a signal of bad outcome, but those who responded, um, and this was over a four year period of time, those who had an initial response, as I, as I indicated, um, had equivalent um, outcomes uh, over a four year period to those who got placebo. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Jeff uh, Hoch and then from Patrick G. So let's start with Jeff. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Mustafa. Thank you very much for the evidence review. When I did a quick look-see at the, the letters that you could use, I, I see that you could have chosen I or you could have maybe chosen P and I, and I wondered if you could help us understand why for all um, three that you reviewed, you went with I instead of P slash I. Um, yeah, thanks for this excellent question. And as I noted, um, especially for that dialysis independent 
chronic kidney disease compared to placebo, we actually, the draft report was posted with PI. Um, it, the reason why we went with I is we just have felt if, if there is this much uncertainty around different outcomes like mortality. So when there is five fewer versus four more per hundred per two year treatment, we feel this is a large difference and it will take us in a completely different direction. And, and that's why we really felt we had um, is, is insufficient. The other thing is, as I mentioned, um, and as, as Dr. Rend pointed in his presentation, we have a lot of uncertainties about some of these outcomes. Are they reported at 21 days, 28 days? Are they long-term? Um, so all these uncertainties with uh, different reasons and missing data added to our, our uncertainty. And that's why we, we ended up with, with, the, with the eye. I think if, if there is um, a signal for worsening mortality, that's going to be a big an important signal to highlight, um, which again, where we're, we have so many uncertainties to deal with. But it is a very good question, thank you. And I don't know if Dr. Rend, if you wanna add anything to that. Um, no, I actually think that that summarizes it perfectly. I think the in the dialysis independent versus placebo, initially we were feeling that the bulk of the evidence pointed us towards it being more likely to have benefit than harm. And so we gave it a PI. But as the issues came up around how these um, outcomes were being reported and pooled, it raised questions for us about all the pooling of all the outcomes, all the pooled hazard ratios, at which point we felt that we really couldn't go with a PI and that in a rating of insufficient was more appropriate. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a final question from Patrick Gee, and then we will try to uh, keep moving on our agenda timeline. Go ahead, Patrick. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mustafa, for um, that presentation. I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, was there any evidence um, revealed on the um, if a patient built up resistance to the um, medications. And secondly, um, I know with me being a COVID long hauler and also dealing with anemia, um, as I was battling post-infection fatigue syndrome, I noticed that they really monitor um, my anemia because it was just kind of sporadic at that time. So I'm wondering if you encounter any participants that um, had tested COVID positive and overcame COVID um, that may have caused some um, unusual things to occur during the clinical trial. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Gee, uh, great questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the first one. Um, one of the challenges is that in the HIF inhibitor, in the Roxadostat um, arm, a lot of the studies protocols allowed the use of ESA. So if the patient did not receive, for example, and it was unclear, are they going to increase the HIF, uh, the Roxadostat dose first, are they going to start with ESA? And, and that really doesn't help us to answer your first question, how much resistance there was, how often did that happen? That I don't know. But what we know is with using Roxadostat, in, in the vast majority decreased the need for IV iron um, and, and decreased the need for transfusion. Sometimes it's significant, sometimes not. So that's the first part. The second question is, is a great question, is one that we all will have to um, find practical answers to as we're treating patients. Um, however, uh, and I'm gonna ask the research team to, to correct me if I'm wrong, these trials that we have reported results on, many of them um, predate COVID-19 as far as recruiting patients. So even, I'm, I'm suspicious that even if some, you know, did continue after COVID-19, that wasn't yet where we're in hot spots and when times where COVID-19 was very prevalent. I am not aware 
of any uh, reported cases about HIF and uh, COVID-19 in these trials. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I would like to add that here a comment uh, in regards to the uh, resistance, potential resistance to PHT inhibitors. And I will say that really um, we don't have data uh, to say on a patient specific basis or predict if someone you know, is not going to respond. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to assess uh, in the future what is the response of patients who are uh, resistant to EPO because the mechanism of action you know, of prol hydroxylase inhibitors is different it, and it may be that this population has a different response, meaning that <clears throat> maybe someone who doesn't respond well to ESA, it may or not respond um, to prol hydroxylase inhibitors. You know, I want to say that PHD inhibitors enhance uh, endogenous HIPO production from the kidney and the liver. Uh, so even patients who are anephric, they will respond to PHD inhibitors because of EPO production from the liver. And it seems that you don't really uh, need that much of EPO induction to trigger erythropoietic response. So I will say that overall, you know, there have, patients will have an increase in EPO, they will have a change in additional different pathways, and we will have to see what will be the net effect in the setting of inflammation, like, you know, in COVID patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to uh, move to our next presentation. I would like to introduce Dr. Lisa Bloduk, who is our lead modeler, and she will present the evidence and economic modeling. All right, hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Lisa Blodek, a research scientist for the University of Washington School of Pharmacy and Choice Program. Um, go ahead and next slide. I'd also like to acknowledge Josh Carlson at the University of Washington and John Campbell at ICER um, for their collaboration in the development of this model. And we have no relevant financial uh, disclosures. Next slide. All right, our objective was to estimate the cost effectiveness of Roxadustat for these two patient populations, the dialysis independent CKD and the dialysis dependent CKD, um, both compared to ESAs. Next slide. All right, I'll go through the methods. Uh, we constructed a Markov model from a US healthcare sector perspective um, in these two separate populations. So dialysis independent in stage 3B to 5 or dialysis dependent CKD over a lifetime time horizon. We calculated qualies, life years, equal value life years, as well as MACE plus events, red blood cell transfusions, and use of IV iron. But due to the insufficient rating versus ESAs, we did not calculate ratios. So we did not calculate a cost per quality ratio. So I'll be presenting the cost outcomes and I'll be presenting the um, health benefit outcomes sort of separately. Next slide. All right, this is the model structure for the dialysis independent population. Patients enter the model based on the CKD stage, uh, based on the distribution of the trial. Um, so this is uh, primarily driven by the one head-to-head -head trial of Roxadustat versus ESAs. They progress through chronic kidney disease stages all the way through dialysis dependent, transplant or death over a lifetime time horizon. And these are based on transition probabilities from the literature or USDRS. Um, one exception there is the probability of death in the dialysis dependent population, we actually use that probability from the Roxadustat phase three trials. Patients are treated with Roxadustat or ESAs um, as long as they're dialysis independent. Um, when they progress to dialysis dependence, we had everyone switch to ESAs, um, and that was to keep the focus of this uh, economic analysis in this population on that dialysis independent group. All right, next slide. For the dialysis dependent population, basically it's the same as the previous model, except patients enter later. Um, they enter as dialysis dependent patients, they're treated with Roxadustat or ESAs, and they can transition between staying in the dialysis dependent state, a transplant um, back to dialysis independence, dialysis dependent, I mean, or death. Next slide. All right. 
For the dialysis dependent population, we know that there's some innovative payment systems. So we actually considered two different sort of pricing perspectives. One was based on ASP pricing, just drug acquisition costs. And we call this the commercial perspective. We also considered a Medicare perspective with this bundled payment system. Under this system, ESAs, IV iron, and red blood cell transfusions are already part of this bundled payment. Um, so there's essentially no uh, incremental cost these uh, to the payer. Um, so we considered Roxidustat as an added cost for the first three years, after which it was included in the bundle at no extra cost. And this is based on some, some precedents. Next slide. All right, a couple key model assumptions to point out again. Um, we assumed that um, the progression of CKD, these health state transitions, um, was on published transition probabilities, and there's no impact of roxadustat or anemia treatment on CKD progression, with the exception of a, a potential impact on mortality um, with the data that we had available to us. We considered ESAs to be one group with equivalent efficacy and safety. So we'll just be talking about ESAs, not specifically epoepin or darbipoetin or any specific ESA. We assume that all the dialysis independent patients use subcutaneous ESAs. Um, we assume that upon progression to dialysis dependence, all the dialysis independent patients switch to dialysis dependent, switch to ESAs. Um, and then lastly, we considered impact on MACE plus in dialysis dependent population, but we did not consider any impact on MACE plus in the dialysis, uh, I think I misspoke, um, but we did not consider uh, MACE plus events in the dialysis independent population um, because of the results of that one head-to-head -head trial. Um, and I will talk a little more about that in subsequent slides. Next slide. All right, I'll go through a few of the key model inputs. So layered upon this CKD progression model, we look at the impact of roxadustat on anemia treatment. So this is measured by hemoglobin. Um, so for each of the populations, we have a mean difference between roxadustat and ESAs. Um, so we've used these. Next slide. We also have annual treatment costs um, for both roxadustat and ESAs. They're dosed according to, um, to titrate to the correct hemoglobin level. So there's no like standard dose over the year per patient. This presented a bit of a challenge to cost these out. Um, but for the dialysis independent population, we sort of presumed an average ESA utilization based on these pre-filled syringes, a sort of representative dose that's in the label. For dialysis dependent population, we found an average utilization of epoetin alpha and then converted it to the other ESAs using published uh, conversion factors. Roxadustat, of course, is not available right now and there is no price. Um, based on analyst estimates, um, they expect that the price of Roxadustat may be sort of in line with ESAs. Um, so the placeholder price we use was 6,500 per year. So for the commercial perspective, it's always 6,500. For Medicare, it's 6,500 for three years, after which it goes into the bundle. And then for ESAs, based on this sort of pre-filled syringes or um, average utilization, we get about um, 7,900 for the dialysis independent population and about 7,000 for the dialysis dependent population. Okay, next slide. All right. Um, although uh, Roxadustat or ESAs are not expected to impact the CKD stages. We still included a cost of these CKD stages um, to try to fully capture the costs and outcomes of these patients over a lifetime time horizon. Um, so I won't go over them in, in detail, but there is a substantial cost with treating these patients. Next slide. All right. We also have a utility applied to each of the health states. Um, again, this is so that we could accurately quantify the number of the utilities over the lifetime time horizon. Um, where we do have an impact on utility scores is per one gram de decrease in hemoglobin. So what we do is we take, um, say you're at stage three, we take this utility of 0.82, we uh, reduce that utility based on this patient having anemia, and then we adjusted the utility back up based on the treatment effect 
and the utility loss per one gram decrease in hemoglobin. Next slide. All right. Um, so upon all of this, we also layer the potential impact of MACE plus. So I'll take you through sort of our rationale for where we, where we landed. For the dialysis independent population, based on the one head-to-head -head trial versus ESA, there was no statistically significant difference in the impact of MACE or MACE plus. So this is the top forest plot. So we did not consider this in our base case analysis. For the dialysis dependent population, um, the data that was available to us um, and presented at a conference earlier this year showed a statistically significant reduction in MACE plus events um, for rocks adduced at versus ESAs. And this in does not include Pyrenees, the study that you and Dr. Um, Mustafa uh, discuss. Um, for that reason, we went down the path of including MACE plus in our base case analysis. Okay, next slide. Uh, our next step was to disaggregate MACE plus because MACE plus is a, a group of events that are all different. Um, so we broke out each individual MACE plus event. So we have all cause mortality, MI, stroke, unstable, and angina, um, or hospitalization for heart failure. Um, for all cars mortality, we use the risk ratio that ICER calculated for um, all four trials. For the remainder, we only could use the risk ratios that we calculated from events in the three published phase three trials without Pyrenees. Um, this was modeled as a constant per cycle risk of each MACE event, um, and it was included in our base case for the dialysis dependent population and as a scenario in the dialysis independent population. Next slide. Um, each MACE plus event had a cost and a disutility attributed to it. Um, and I'll just direct your attention that um, for a few of them, for post-MI and post-stroke, we, uh, we included that there could be um, sequelae of those that were long-term. Um, so there was some post-MI and post-stroke that throughout the duration of the model time horizon, there was a cost and disutility associated with those states. Next slide. All right. The model also included red blood cell transfusions um, with data from the phase three trials. Um, in the dialysis independent population, we knew the proportion of patients on ESAs who had one. Um, and we also knew that there was no difference for rocks adduced at versus ESAs on blood, blood cell transfusions in that group. For the dialysis dependent population, we had a statistically significantly lower uh, hazard ratio for rocks adduced at versus ESAs. Um, so we included that. Next slide. For IV iron, again, we had data from the phase three trials, which showed a reduction in the use of IV iron with rocks adduced at versus ESAs. For dialysis independent, we had the number of infusions per 100 person years and a hazard ratio. For dialysis dependent, we had the number of milligrams per month on average and a reduction with roxaducet in the number of milligrams per month. Next slide. All right, now we'll go to the results. For the dialysis independent population, there was no difference in um, between roxaducet and ESAs for the proportion of patients at the target hemoglobin levels or red blood cell transfusions or MACE plus in the base case. We did find a potential cost savings for roxaducet but um, bolded and underlined, this is a placeholder price. Um, so that will be heavily dependent on the final price. Although some of this was also driven by a reduction in the use of IV iron. So we have a cost savings of about 8,000 and no real difference in qualities or life years. Next slide. All right, go ahead and click. In one-way sensitivity analysis, um, there should just be, there we go. Um, the direct cost of rocks adduced at, which is a placeholder, was really the biggest model driver, and everything else was fairly modest in the ability to, to swing the potential cost savings. Next slide. All right. So this is a um, cost effectiveness scatter plot, um, and the x-axis is the incremental qualities, so the the benefit versus ESAs, and the y-axis is the incremental cost, so the difference in cost versus ESAs. And the way this is generated is that you know, our model uses point estimates, so like the hazard ratio of you know, 1.05 in the dialysis dependent population, for example. 
But what we also do is we apply a distribution. So let's say there's a normal distribution and we use the confidence interval that's available to us for the standard error um, to sort of get a range of, of possible values based on the information that we have with the point estimate and the uncertainty. So how we generate this is we run the model 10,000 times, automated of course, and we record the outcome each time. So you can see on this plot, all these dots are the outcomes of all those PSAs. So you can see this is the, sort of the range, the cloud of possible outcomes that you could have with this model based on the data that we have available to us right now. And you'll see that um, all of the iterations in the dialysis independent population were cost saving, although this is a placeholder cost. Um, but about half of them were had better outcomes with the rocks reduced step versus DSAs, and about half of them had worse outcomes. So really, this is there to give you an impression of just how much uncertainty there is in whether Roxidustat is, is better or worse from a health perspective. Next slide. All right, we did a number of scenarios. Um, the base case was uh, modestly cost saving. If we include a modified societal perspective with indirect costs, um, it's a little more cost saving. If we include the potential impact on MACE+, plus, um, you may recall back in the one head-to-head -head trial versus ESAs, their point estimate for MACE plus was below one. There was a non-statistically significant reduction in MACE plus events with Roxidustet debt versus ESAs. So if we include that point estimate, we get slightly increased costs and um, increased qualities. Next slide. All right, now we'll go for the dialysis dependent group. Um, in this, in this population, we found fewer life years and fewer qualities. Um, there was a lower cost for Roxidustat. Again, this is a placeholder price. But some other con contributions to this lower cost is that there were fewer red blood cell transfusions. The point estimates for some MACE events were lower for Roxidustat than ESAs. And also, there's an increased mortality. So you have patients that health states are expensive, patients cost money to treat. So with this increase in mortality, inadvertently leads to some cost savings. Um, so here you have, a. if we take the commercial perspective, it's 30,000 cost savings over a lifetime, Medicare 22,000, but fewer qualities, fewer life years, and fewer equal value life years. Next slide. All right, if we look at the one-way sensitivity analysis, going to click, this time it's really the risk ratios for all-cause mortality, MI and stroke, that are driving the model results. And this is the incremental total cost. Okay, next slide. Here we are back at our PSA. So 46%, about half, have um, higher qualities with Roxidustet versus ESAs. Go ahead and click. About half have lower costs for Roxidustet versus ESAs. And 46% actually have lower costs and lower qualities versus ESAs. So this is just to show you how much uncertainty there is that this could really land a lot of different places based on the uncertainty of all the parameters that we have. Okay, next slide. And here are our scenarios. Um, in our base case, we had lower costs and lower qualities. From a modified societal perspective, we had even uh, more cost savings, but still lower qualities. And if we exclude any impact on MACE, if we really say we don't know, um, we get a marginally higher cost and marginally higher qualities because we did have a, a reduction in red blood cell transfusions and IV iron. Okay, next slide. All right, some of the limitations. We are limited by published data. Um, many of these came from, as Reem said, uh, dossiers and um, from conferences. We also would like to note that there's a lot of heterogeneity in patient symptoms. Most of our quality gains outside of MACE was from hemoglobin. Um, and hemoglobin doesn't directly translate to increase in quality of life and utility um, in a really linear way for all patients. We also would like to acknowledge that we don't capture all potential benefits. Specifically, red blood cell transfusions can have an impact on transplant eligibility and outcomes. Um, and that wasn't quantified within the model. And also the availability of an oral treatment option may be a benefit to some patients, which is not currently included in the model. Next slide. All right, a few comments to note. Um, we did receive comments to either take away the health state cost with CKD or emphasize that um, 
less costly treatments don't necessarily lead to greater value or gain in lives. We decided to keep the health state costs in so we could accurately capture the full cost um, over a lifetime time horizon for these patients. But I hope that we've done a good job emphasizing that just because it's less costly doesn't mean that health benefit is being generated. We also received a comment to provide um, an emphasis on the uncertainty in the PSA results. Um, which led us to include some of those today and include more of that uncertainty um, in how we present the results in the report. We don't know exactly how Roxadu's debt's going to fit in the, the bundled payment system. Um, the, all of that is very uncertain right now, but we did provide two different ways to look at it, one just based on drug acquisition costs and one based on a potential scenario of inclusion in the Medicare bundle. Um, we received a comment about the subgroup of incident dialysis. Um, we had set out to potentially look at this as a subgroup, um, but since we did not have information on the complementary subgroup of stable dialysis, um, we did not pursue that for the cost effectiveness analysis. And finally, um, as I mentioned before, the model does not fully include um, all of the impact of IV iron and red blood cell transfusion. Next. All right, in conclusion, um, rocks, rocks that do set may be cost saving, um, but it's a placeholder price and there's a high degree of uncertainty and with a potential mortality consequence in the dialysis dependent population. Um, for dialysis independent, similar health outcomes, there may be a cost savings driven by a reduction in ESA um, and IV iron. For the dialysis dependent population, there's cost savings, but potentially worse health outcomes. Um, but there is some reduction in benefit in reducing red blood cell transfusions and iron. Um, but a lot of the cost savings is driven by less time spent in CKD health states. Um, so that's that potential mortality consequence. Next slide. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So I'd like to open it up to questions. We are running a little bit behind our uh, agenda timeline, but we um, have time for questions and we can still uh, take our break. So um, I am looking for raised hands and I see one from Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Um, thank you and thank you for that presentation. Um, just to put this in perspective, can you make any comment about the ESAs, their cost effectiveness versus their what was standard of care before them? Because some of the studies I've seen suggested it's unclear what, if any, quality benefit they have overall, given the uncertainty and mortality. So, it, yeah, we did not investigate that um, as a research question, although we did think about it. Um, we were driven by um, sort of the clinical opinion that patients who use ESAs or Roxaducet need to use those, um, so they would be treated with something. Um, so placebo was not included in our analysis. We didn't consider that as a, like a realistic um, clinical option for these patients. Any other panel members who have questions right now? I'm not seeing any at the moment. Well, unless there are any other questions that I'm not seeing, um, Steve, I think we Good. can move to our break. I agree. Now we're a tiny bit behind, but not too badly. Um, and again, there will be chance for further questions as we deliberate on the evidence before the votes. So let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. It's, um, let's see, what time is it out there? It's 1.30 on the East Coast. That means it's 10.30 your time, right? 10 so mm -hmm. let's take 10 minutes and reconvene to start sharply at 10.40 um, a.m. Pacific time for the uh, public comments. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. See everybody in 10 minutes. <laughs> 